Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on September 19, 2021, are Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 18 through 20. The semi-continuous reading continues in Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. The psalm is Psalm 54. We've got our fourth of five readings from James chapter 3, verses 13 through chapter 4, verse 3, and then 7 through 8a, not b, a, and then Mark 9, 30 through 37. All right. They always mess up after Jesus predicts his death. Somebody always says or does something really stupid. In Mark, anyway, right? Yeah. So there's that, right? They didn't understand what he was saying. They were afraid to ask him. Then they start arguing about who's the greatest. They're just idiots. Well, and the point is? Well, the point seems to be the more Jesus talks about his death, the more confused people get. Uh, he's just got to finally actually just go and die for them to understand. We don't know if they understand in Mark, but. There is that, but it also creates an occasion. I think it's because there's something so disruptive about what he's saying or so unexpected and just kind of crazy about what he's predicting or, or affirming here that um, it creates an opportunity by contrast to show this is what the way of the cross is. So here the correction involves taking a child and the commentary from Cliff Black does a really nice job saying, what that means, you know, what it means then to take somebody with, with virtually no status, right? Somebody that you can't really get anything from in terms of honor or advancement in the world and says, uh, this is what it looks like, right? It's, it's like welcoming a child like this. So, I mean, it's, it's not just that Jesus is saying, I'm going to explain law to you and then you'll get it. He's got to really reshape or really upend their value systems as well in this uh, central part of Mark. I want to go back to what um, you said last week uh, on the podcast, Matt, which is um, the, so we have these uh, sets of Christological disclosures, uh, which are, as you guys know from years past, I don't like to call them passion predictions, but rather the verb is teach. He was teaching them what it means for him to be the Christ and, uh, and the impossibility before the cross and resurrection actually happens of, of, of that sinking in. And how is it possible that the Christ that we've expected could do this? Uh, and then the, these are then discipleship disclosures. And so the, it's the upside down kingdom in the old metaphor, which is everything, all the values of the world are turned on their head, shaken up, and then uh, reshaped into a uh, mind-blowing, uh, whoever wants to be first must be a servant and must welcome a child. And when they do that, what they actually welcome me and the one who sent me. I mean, it's, it's right, crazy. Well, and I think the other thing that, uh, the other thing that adds to, to all of that and really um, exacerbates the issue is that We've skipped a few verses, you might have noticed, between the end of last week's lection and this week. And what we've skipped is the transfiguration and then the, uh, the last exorcism that Jesus uh, does in the Gospel of Mark. And I think, uh, I think that interlude, if you will, of the transfiguration, the exorcism, also contribute to this just... Uh, what is going on here? Uh, you know, one moment, you know, it's taking up your cross and the next minute you're on a mountain glowing. I mean, it's, uh, there's this, <laughs> not that I'm, not that I'm trying to let the disciples weasel, weasel out of their uh, inability to understand. I don't mean that, but, but it's in part, that's what Jesus is trying to hold together. I, uh, you know, the passion predictions are, they're not just, as you said, they're teachings, but they're, they're uh, also predictors of the resurrection. Uh, I, yes, I will go undergo great suffering, but I will also rise again, which is equally as mind blowing. And so uh, I think having, having 
having those two stories of the transfiguration and the exorcism, again, going back to the very first thing that Jesus does of, 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 of transforming an individual from possession of by an evil spirit to, uh, to uh, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ is those two passages, I think, could also help with that. Another thing that's that's earth shattering here or surprising here, and it's not clear that the disciples understand it or not, but it could figure into their confusion is uh, verse 31, the son of man is to be betrayed into human hands, uh, can be read and I think is best read when you read the cry of dereliction at the end in chapter 15, my God, why have you forsaken me as a statement of not just simply Jesus is saying, my enemies will one day over, overtake me, but rather that God will hand him over to human authority, that there is a sense of obedience here of his own submission to, I want to be really careful my words here, to a kind of a divine uh, intention. Uh, you know, the garden is in, in, as well is important for this in, in Mark 14. None of that's really clear at this point in the story or what that looks like, what that would mean, but that's, there's something frightful about that that Mark never fully answers, and of course creates a lot of big questions <laughs> uh, among people trying to you know, navigate their own Christologies of what that looks like. But it's um, part of what's being foretold here or foretaught here is not just that these things are going to happen to Jesus, but human authority, human power, the human will is finally gonna get to do what it wants to do with him. Uh, and it's gonna be ruthless, it's gonna be terrible. There's no more divine protection, so to speak, or divine authority governing him in what's about to happen. I'm not sure how you preach that on September 19th, but it's worth noting, and it might fit into some sermons as you think about how traumatic this, um, the, these, this short collection of verses would be in the ears of, its, of, um, of Jesus' hearers, his companions. Well, I want to go back to last week again. Um, Caroline was talking about how... Um, if the focus is on discipleship these weeks, um, because that's where it is in the, the gospel readings, that to help people see where this happens and what it looks like in daily life, um, that, that you know there are people who do have the occasion to um, not be first, but to be last and servant and to welcome uh, that, the one with no status in their midst. This happens, you know, all the time and invite people to think about what does that look like in your daily life? What are the power structures there or the values, I mean, or, or, or the, the, the value structures and um, how does, uh, you know, in our set, you know, in our setting, you know, we're teachers. So it's, you, know, you, you, you can see sometimes in classrooms where things like this happen, where the one without a voice is, is given a chance to have a voice and so on. But um, what about the other um, settings where people work and live? I think it's an important reminder too, and, and Cliff Black gets to this at the, toward the end of his commentary, that this top to bottom reversal of rank uh, realigns how listeners should receive those whom they have mistakenly regarded as beneath them. Uh, and, but it's also a, 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 a lens through which to see discipleship as not just what you do, you know, are you welcoming, are you, are you, uh, are you welcoming those who are beneath you? But it's also the way in which you situate yourself in the world. How do you, how do you reflect on who you are in the world? How do you, how does how you regard yourself then affect how you regard others? And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not only this, I think, uh, reflection on action, but a reflect on embodiment and, 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 and presentation of mind, but how do you how do you think of people, and then how do you think of yourself, and uh, what does that say then about about whether or not you recognize that the kingdom of God has come near? Jeremiah. Jeremiah seems to be what interested in obedience as well. I mean, I hear that theme there. Otherwise, it's a really difficult pairing in my book. <laughs> I don't see how you preach this Jeremiah text 
by itself, but you could find a way to. It's almost impossible. I mean, yeah. uh, I don't know, uh, Megan Fullerton Strollo. I don't know if you, that's how you pronounce who wrote the commentary on the website, but um, we gave her a tough assignment, you know, to write a commentary for this, uh, for a preaching website, because as she points out, it's part of the, this is part of his, uh, the so-called laments of Jeremiah, and this is just part of one of them. And so you're missing, you know, you're missing the full context of, uh, of what's going on. So it's, it's difficult. You can see how, uh, why thematically it's paired with the um, reading from Mark, uh, what is it, Mark 8? So, or well, 9. Maybe, I mean, nine. yeah, and maybe you don't spend a lot of time preaching Jeremiah, but it does raise the question of obedience as a religious concept, right? And obedience is a term that that sometimes, and for good reason, has bad associations attached to it. Um, I can imagine a context where a preacher wants to explore that. Um, and it's not just here, of course, you have plenty of other writings. I mean, I think of the book of Hebrews, for example, which has so much to say about uh, this notion of obedience or training and discipline and things like that. So um, in that regard, if that's what you're talking about this week. <laughs> There's plenty there in, in what Jesus says to his followers and also Jeremiah. But maybe Proverbs 31 is more exciting. Maybe you want to talk about the psalm? Well, I want to talk about Proverbs 31, uh, first of all, uh, because of the mind-blowingly unwise translation uh, in, the first, in the first line. So, I mean, it is interesting just to note that you've got the start of Proverbs and the end of Proverbs, you've got these uh, whip woman figures. And uh, it's a capable wife who can find is the NRSV translation, terrible translation. The word translated as capable is chayil, which is really valor or strength or might. And so I think, I think Elaine James suggests courage so a courageous mm -hmm. i would say more like a valiant or valorous i mean it, it's stronger to me than just the word courage okay anyway that is i mean <laughs> capable is okay capable yeah you fixed, it. It. It, you fixed the psalm Ralph, or the yeah powers. i mean the powers you i don't think there's anything to fix other than that translation capable is so um not even close this is just a you know, a fabulous, a, a valorous, valiant uh, wife who can find. And then, you know, it talks about all these things that women actually did in the marketplace that women actually did in the ancient world, you know, uh, that just slow down, even if you're not going to preach it, just slow down and just look at all the things that women are doing in the economy of the village, you know, um, buying and selling property, you know, making very important economic moves, um, really the strength of the family system. And just a reminder, we might tend to think of a binary here of just like uh, husband and wife, but people were part of households uh, that were at least three generation households, which is the building block of society, still is, but in the ancient world, this uh, all living together. And so what you've got here is really an extension of the commandment uh, of honor your father and mother that you've got the mother here as, uh, as head of household. Yeah. And again, I would, I, if you decide to preach on this, uh, I think that, I think that clarification is critical, uh, Rolf. And again, looking at, uh, Elaine James commentary mm -hmm. is outstanding, uh, because, and, you know, depending on your context, but I say this often to what extent uh, preaching sometimes needs to be a corrective when you find passages like this that are used uh, in, as she notes, to perpetuate culturally specific gendered ideals, uh, to uphold purity culture to the detriment of women. Um, and all genders. And so uh, just the, the way in which even um, from a homiletical and exegetical uh, perspective that 
that the preacher is aware of where, do, you know, where do some of these things come from when the people, when people say, well, the Bible says, you know, uh, and you're like, well, where is that? Well, here's one of those places. Uh, and uh, is this a moment to, uh, to offer that corrective, depending on what you've been doing the last couple of weeks? For Elaine James's uh, six bullet points at the beginning of her commentary are just- Exactly, those yeah. Are really yeah. gold. Even if you don't preach on this, this is a reminder for reading a text like this as a, as a professional exegete. That's, yeah, exactly. As all our preachers are. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, Psalm 54. And we've got a commentary by some guy named Carl. Yes. Carl. I almost feel Jacobson. like I shouldn't say anything because, again, it's we've got all these great writers and commentators. And this one, in of course, is uh, my brother. Uh, this, uh, Did you like I, setting I, your tree forts and, and <laughs> you know, when you were little and, and or your little, you know, table forts that you made in your bedroom and and uh, sit in your forts and like talk about the Psalms and your mom or dad would come in and say, what are you, what are you two doing? Uh, no, we didn't do that, but we had two older sisters that persecuted us. So save me, oh God, and vindicate me by <laughs> your might was something that at least I had to pray often uh, because of my um, two older sisters who- I get uh, it, I get it. Who were the oppressors, not the oppressed uh, in, in our childhood economy. Um, you know, this is um, this is a psalm, as Carl says. Uh, you know, talking about the uh, I don't know, right? The, the really sort of chutzpah. He doesn't use that word of crying out to God and demanding help, and we do it because of a relationship that God has established. Um, I think, you know, if the thing that is happening here is that the, it could be, or just to, you could even just imagine it this way, is that the, the, the one praying this Psalm has been um, the, the victim of false witness. People have lied uh, perhaps about him in such a way that uh, he or she is in great danger. And I know that I, at times in my life, uh, have felt that I was the victim of false witness, but I know other people uh, were the victim of false witness in a much greater stakes. And so this is not a Psalm that just really says, uh, I'm not guilty of anything, but rather it's really saying, I have this specific need right now uh, because of what's, uh, because of a at-risk situation I'm in and I need your help. Okay, I have a question, uh, Rolf, yep. and in verse four, but surely God is my helper. The word helper, mm -hmm. is there, is there a, uh, what is that, does that word actually mean help? Is that a good translation? Is there a different way to have a sense of that word? Not that it's a bad word, I'm fine with help, but I just was curious about that. Well, it's, it's the same word as in um, Genesis, where God <gasps> says we need we need a helper. I was that, wondering about that. And yeah. the point is, the, yeah. the one most often called helper, Azer, in the Old Testament, or Ozer, is God. Mm -hmm. that, and so it, it, this helps understand that that is not a diminutive, but rather it's an equal partner in Genesis 2. And that God here is yeah. the only one to whom this person in whatever suffering can turn. And, um, you know, uh, we were talking, I think, Caroline, you mentioned recently uh, last in last week's podcast, you know, the, um, the violence in Afghanistan that then has spilled over to other, other countries. And so I heard from some of our... Um, Christian friends and graduates of our school in Nigeria uh, who've had to go into hiding. One member of the church was uh, killed um, this uh, what, recently. And um, as we're recording this, it has happened in the last week. And just to realize that there are, maybe right now you're not, maybe right now you are, most, are, are in a safe place. There's other people who are, for whom this sort of thing is an urgent prayer right now. That's always worth remembering. 
And here we are with James. We're almost through, Rolf. We're getting there. One more Sunday after hey, I, this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a harvest of righteousness that's sown in peace for those who make peace. I'm down with that. I think, in, uh, I think to get into this part of James so that we don't treat it as just, you know, uh, another, another piece of the book of Proverbs or something like that, but dislocated into the New Testament that um, to get a sense of a couple of things. One is the way in which Jesus is in some ways the, the unspoken model for so much. So the very beginning, this notion of works done with gentleness, born of wisdom um, is, is significant, right? Something that's Christ-like. But then what's one thing I think that makes James so great, <laughs> so turbocharged, is the way it imagines the threat. Um, think of how the book of Revelation imagines the threat of living in the Roman Empire and how salty that book is as a response. James doesn't have the same vividness or saltiness, of course, but James sees the world as an incredibly dangerous landscape for the church to try to be the church. So this is on my mind because I'm preaching next week on James 5, but... Um, so when it talks about wisdom that's earthly, unspiritual, devilish, uh, this notion of partiality or hypocrisy, we talked about hypocrisy a bit last week around the tongue, uh, these things that are at war within you. I mean, James really sees the church trying to live out a Christ-like faith in, in, a, in a territory that is almost certain to corrupt it. And it just freaks James out, um, you know, because I think he knows the, the reality of the, of the crisis so well. Um, and so how you kind of weave that intensity into what otherwise can look like good advice is a really important thing for a preacher to think about. <laughs>